Thank you very much. I know it's the end of the day. We're almost there. Thank you for staying. It's been a long day. It's been really interesting. Thanks to the organizer for inviting me. It's been an amazing conference. My name is Navana, and uh, as you heard, I'm coming from a Canadian company called Shopify. And today I'm going to tell you about order fraud detection system that we have built. Today we have already heard about fraud detection at Danske Bank. And you will hear we are facing a lot of the same problems. We went about the implementation slightly differently. So I hope you enjoy the talk and uh, you find it interesting. So to start with, I'm going to first introduce the environment uh, where the problem is happening. So I'll tell you a little bit about Shopify. Then I'm going to introduce the problem. And finally, how we have solved it or how we have implemented how, what we have developed regarding it, and uh, what we have learned. We have learned a lot. Shopify is a leading cloud-based multi-channel uh, platform designed to make uh, commerce really simple and accessible to everybody. What I mean by that is that anybody can, a merchant can set up, design, and run their shop on multiple channels, obviously web and mobile, but also social media. They can be running their shop uh, integrated on Instagram or Facebook or Pinterest. They can be also selling at marketplaces such as Amazon or Etsy, but they can be having their own actual physical shop, a physical location, or they might be having pop-up shops or be selling at Sunday markets. To uh, be able to control and manage all of this, we have developed a powerful back office, which gives a single view to how the business is doing across all of these channels. This allows big merchants such as Tesla, Budweiser, Kylie Jenner's to prosper, but also the small and medium-sized merchants to develop and grow. Anybody can set up a shop from the comfort of their own couch or maybe from their basement. Uh, this is a huge ecosystem. Uh, it involves a lot of people, first and foremost our merchants, but also employees, and then there are third-party app developers and partners and many others. And we are all working towards one goal, to make a sale. And making a sale is an exhilarating, amazing, positive feeling for our merchants. But what happens if an item was purchased with a fraudulent or a stolen credit card? Say that my credit card was stolen. Fraudsters usually uh, first test the credit card, so they may try to make a couple of small purchases. That means that because I'm a heavy credit card user, it may take me months to even notice that something is wrong, that somebody else is using my credit card. At that time, I would call up my credit card company. They file a dispute. And if it's proven that these transactions have been made illegally, all of them are canceled. What it means for our merchants? Well, they've made a sale maybe months ago, wrapped it up, put it, packaged it, and shipped it away. They were happy. Now, it's been months, they're out of money. So they're out of the goods, they're out of money, and to make it worse, insult to injury, they even have to pay a fee, a dispute fee. As you can imagine, this is a very bad thing. It, it's devastating. It's devastating emotionally, but it's also eating up into their profit margins. And it doesn't matter if the merchant is small or big. Depending on how severe the fraud is, certain credit card companies uh, are also able to cut the contract with the merchant and stop serving them altogether. So it's a huge problem. And that's the problem we will be addressing today. There we go. <laughs> So what is it that we want to make? Let's start with outlining what is the product going to look like. Well, what we would like to do is to surface a recommendation to our merchants before they fulfill the order. 
If they come to a place where they have wrapped up the product and shipped it away, they're out of the goods, right? But before that, they can decide what to do. If they're compelled that something is truly odd uh, and doesn't look good, they can cancel the order. Otherwise, they may contact the customer and ask for extra ID. Or they can say, look, I know this order looks weird, but uh, this is my returning customer. We love them, and we are certainly going to proceed with the order, right? Now that we know where we are going, uh, what are the technical requirements for this system? Well, it needs to run in almost or as close to real time as possible. As soon as an order is placed, the merchant will get a notification on their mobile device, and they can see you've, that, that they've got an order, an order. At that time, they can fulfill it. And they should also, at that time, see uh, our recommendation about risk involved with this order, right? So if we have a system that's super good, but we surface this information to our merchants twice a day, that won't cut it, right? The next one is uh, kind of obvious. It shouldn't stop the checkout. Uh, if we have a model which takes half an hour to evaluate at the checkout time and it's just stopping the order placement, it won't work. It doesn't scale. Which brings us to the next point. On any given day, uh, in any given minute, we process hundreds of checkouts per minute. During the flash sales, this number goes upwards of 6,000 checkouts per minute. That means we see a checkout in less than 10 milliseconds. And we need to comply to this, right? The last but not least is accuracy. Fraud is rare. It happens at a fraction of a percent. So for the example, if we have 1,000 orders and one of them is fraudulent, and our recommendation is that all of them are good. That means that we are correct 999 times out of 1,000. That's amazing for most traditional metrics, right? But it totally beats the purpose of we, what we are trying to do. OK, so these are our requirements. So how did it, this project start? Uh, the First iteration of it, as you can imagine, was very simple, primitive. It started as a Hack Days project. And Hack Days is when employees in the company stop whatever they're doing uh, for two days and do something that they think is interesting and important. What can you do in two days? Well, you can look at the checkout data, what's coming in, and say, is the customer hiding behind a web proxy? If they are, that's risky. Did they provide us with the correct security code? If they didn't, something's wrong. Did they provide the correct billing address? And so on. So we had this set of hard-coded rules. And if any of them is violated, we would say this is a risky order. If we, there was no risky, uh, or if there was no very bad signal, but some, we couldn't make up our mind about some of them, we would say this is a moderately risky uh, order. And finally, if all of them are good, we would say everything is good, proceed with the order. This is really simple, does not stop the checkout, easy to implement. Problem with it is the accuracy. There's a lot of false positives. Something as simple as shipping something to your cousins that live in a different country, that's not the average behavior. Most of the time, we ship to our own address, right? It would trigger a risk. So what can we do? It's good for the first iteration. It's a proof of concept, but certainly needs improvement. What did we do? Data is our biggest asset. We see our merchants from the day when they join our platform, when they set up their website, when they launch it to public. We see when they make their first sale. We know what third-party apps they're using. We know when they have big marketing campaigns. We know what the average order for them looks like. 
we know a lot about their customers as well. Uh, have we seen them before? How long they've stayed on the website? How many new customer a merchant attracted to their website? We've been collecting this data meticulously for 10 years, storing it into our data warehouse, processing it, modeling it. In this time, we've processed more than 40 billion uh, US dollars in sales. Currently, we are hosting more than half a million active merchants on our platform. Just in 2016, these merchants have added 200 and more than 290 million new products to the platform. And they have served almost every third US citizen. So these are unique customers in 2016. And as a curiosity point, more than half of these orders were placed uh, from a mobile device. This is a vast pool of data. And it's ours, it's at our fingertips, and we have to use it, right? So uh, at this point, my talk is going to diverse in, two, uh, in three topics. I'm first going to talk about features and targets. And then I'm going to talk about pipeline and finally productionizing the model. I think we can all easily unanimously agree that, feature, that the data, uh, features, and targets are the foundation of anything bigger to emerge. However, I can also tell you from the experience that we have either made or come close to making every single mistake in the textbook. So I think it's worth talking about it. And in particular, I want to hint on two points. The first one being that the domain knowledge and really understanding the data you're working with will give you a competitive advantage to build a good model. But the other one is that we have to continuously monitor this data in order to make sure that our models keep being good. I'll talk about this in terms of targets and features. First, targets, because targets are kind of easier. Why well, we want to detect fraud, right? When an order gets a dispute, it's obvious that there was something wrong going on with it. But what if it doesn't get a chargeback? Does it mean that it won't get a chargeback tomorrow, or the next day, or maybe a month later? For this reason, we need to cut out a period of time in which we are just letting data vest. So we are just observing whether or not an order will receive a, a chargeback, a dispute. That means that our training data is truly historical. It's way in the past, right? Uh, then, even when we see a chargeback coming, not every chargeback is fraudulent. It can be labeled as item not received or item not as described. We cannot predict these, right? But remember, bank institutions, financial institutions, are those that file disputes. And there are many of them, and they have different policies. So they may label a dispute as general or unknown. What does it mean? What does it mean for our data? Then, to make it even more interesting, the policies are changing. So some financial institutions these days will issue a warning that the chargeback may be coming. At that time, a merchant can choose to just refund the order so that they do not incur extra fees. But that being said, if the order is refunded, does it mean that it's truly fraudulent or the merchant is just being cautious not to incur any more uh, charges? And then we are mudding our own pool, right? Uh, as we get better, and some merchants will also install the third-party risk apps, the recommendations are sometimes so compelling that they will give up on their sales. They will actually cancel the orders. But if the order is canceled, we will never know whether or not it would have incurred a chargeback later, right? So what do we do with that data? It really requires expertise to know what we are trying to predict, even if it sounds simple. So what did we decide to do? What was our solution? 
we said that for training, we will take the most pure set of data that we can get our hands on. So we eliminated all orders that were refunded or canceled. And now we have only those orders that have been fulfilled. And they have either received a chargeback or not. Okay? But for ver verification purposes, this is not good enough. If merchants are compelled to give up on their sales, we should at least see if we are detecting these orders and how we are performing on them, right? So that's how, what we've done. How about features? Well, I've already told you that we have to cut out this period of time where we cannot do anything. We are just waiting to see whether or not whether a chargeback will occur. That means our data is way in the past. That means that future information can easily leak in. Uh, we had a third party service that would give us uh, a signal, an update, if they've seen any fraudulent activity related to any data provided on our order. These could come days or weeks after the order has been placed. Super predictive feature, totally not available at the checkout time. Next one is deprecation. Because the data is old, we can see a signal in the training data, but the time has passed since the platform has changed, and this feature may not be any available anymore uh, at the execution time, at the checkout time for the current orders, right? And last but not least is changing behavior. And I'll give you a ex very concrete example of what we've noticed. In the literature about order risk, and we've also confirmed it in our training data, an order placed from a mobile device is usually less likely to be fraudulent. This is because it's probably really awkward to put in the credit card numbers in a, a cell phone. But though it's been correct for the training set, Recently, for certain industries, we've noticed that the new orders that we are receiving, those that are fraudulent, are more likely to be coming from a mobile device. And this is kind of expected. Now we have these uh, image recognition apps so that at the checkout time, you just take a sna uh, you snap a picture of your credit card and you get automatically populated numbers in the checkout. So you can test a lot of cards, right? With your cell phone, even easier than actually punching numbers in. So my model that I've trained on the historical data may think that an order com coming from a cell phone, from a mobile device, is less likely to be fraudulent. But that's not the reality currently. And we need to be aware of it. So what have we done? We've set up a, a template or some policies about what it is that we want to know about data before we consider it as a feature. Those include recency and frequency. So when did we first see a signal? How often do we see it? Do we currently observe it on the data, on the current checkouts? Uh, that also means then we look into the normal things. Distribution, this is a classification problem, so distribution across, across the classes. And I will take a moment here to introduce one more part of the problem. The checkout data, so when do we see fraudulent orders? We only see fraud or our targets are available for orders placed on our own Shopify payments gateway. But our merchants can use any gateway. We are integrated with many providers. That means that the model that we are building is supposed to run on all possible orders we see, but we can train only on a subset of them. So at this time, when we are checking the data for features, we do our due diligence to make sure that whatever we are interested in is available across all orders at at least approximately the same rate with the same distribution. We don't have targets, but we can at least check that it's there, right? Good? OK, so we are ready. We have features. We have targets. We are ready to build the model. And our, pipeline, uh, our platform is built on Spark. 
but it is heavily customized. There, there are some excellent uh, data platform engineers and inf data infrastructure engineers even here with me in Stockholm. You can chat with them. Uh, we would have done nothing without them. They provide a lot of custom-made tools for us. The model itself, we are keeping it really simple. Uh, we've done several iterations. We saw that we have lots of repetitive code. So what we do is we've abstracted it to the point that all we need uh, is to specify the input data, the feature transforms, and we are pretty much done. Currently, we are using a random forest, and it's not too deep, it's not too wide, it doesn't have too many trees, because we want really fast evaluation. The runtime is really, really important for us. So, we've, got the, we've trained the model. The testing, the verification part is as usual. We use this uh, stage to define the thresholds. We use the industry standard, so 0.5% of orders are supposed to be classified as high risk, 3% are supposed to fall into the medium risk bucket, and then 96.5% are classified as good orders. These days we are getting better uh, with our models, so the medium risk bucket is shrinking, but you get the idea. And the last thing here is production backtest, and we find it very important. Uh, remember that we have this chunk of data that we don't have targets on. It, we are just observing it to see whether or not we will receive fraud on it, right? Well, yeah, we don't have the targets, but nothing stops us from evaluating our models on it, <clears throat> right? That will give us a notion of how we are doing currently. Because we've trained on really historical data, this will tell us how many orders we are currently, if we were to put this model in production right now, how many orders would be classified as high risk, medium risk, or low risk. Also, remember, we are training only on Shopify payments. If we do this evaluation uh, ahead of the time, we will see how we are doing on other gateways that we cannot train on. So this gives us a peace of mind to know exactly what's going to happen if we were to let this model in production right away. OK? Now, we've got the model. We've tested it. We are happy with it. We need to deploy it. We need, we, the whole point is to surface the recommendation to a merchant. Here is where we hit the wall. Uh, as many of you would not be surprised, I'm sure. Our data platform is in Python. Our core is in Ruby on Rails. Remember all those requirements for this system? It needs to run in real time. It cannot stop the checkout. It needs to scale. Those are extremely high requirements. We need somebody to monitor this service 24-7 at all times. And we have a group of excellent product uh, engineers who do exactly that, but they are experts in Ruby on Rails. All of this is leading towards our model needs to be interpretable in Ruby, but Ruby is not a, a machine learning language. So what can we do? The beginnings. What is the classification, the, the almost language agnostic uh, classification model? Logistic regression, right? It's sigmoid function on a dot product. Any language can do this. So what we've done in the very beginning is we would train a model in Python. Take out the coefficients uh, into this huge GitHub issue, give a detailed description of all feature transforms, and our risk engineers would actually implement it in Ruby. And of course, our communication is so excellent, so all of this goes without a hitch. <laughs> Not at all. Uh, so you can imagine this bought us some time, but it doesn't scale. Uh, so what did we end up doing? 
we decided to use PMML, a uh, predictive modeling markup language. Uh, this is language agnostic uh, way of serializing your predictive model into an XML file. It's just an XML file. doesn't get any simpler than that. But what steps do we need to take to do this? Well, first, we need to get our model from Python into this XML file. And maybe you've noticed on the previous slide, we start preparing for it at the training stage. So oh, I'm the first. <laughs> uh, so we say the, we declare the variables as PMML variables. And we also have feature transforms, which are interpretable in PMML. The, this process is not easy. I'm not going to lie you, to lie to you. It, there's been a lot of custom work. And uh, mostly it was done by my, by my colleague Marek. But then even when you get the XML file, you need to make Ruby uh, aware of it. So we need to let Ruby know how to interpret it. This has mostly been championed, my, but championed by my colleague Kyle. He wrote a package called Pomel. Currently, it's proprietary, but eventually we are thinking of making it open source. He had help from Marek and our interns. And now that Ruby knows how to interpret our model and what to do with it, we need to surface the information to our merchants. That uh, sounds really simple. But remember all those heavy requirements on the model? All of these have to be satisfied at this last step. So we have a group of risk engineers who are tirelessly working on it. Are we done? Almost. We have one more step to go. Remember that data land and production are one step away from each other. So we really don't know what's going on at the production time. To really uh, alleviate this problem, we'll deploy the model in production, but do not surface the information to our merchants. Instead, we put the score and recommendation and all of the features on a Kafka topic. We retrieve that Kafka topic in data land and then reconcile. That's easy. We can match exactly what we are expecting to see in data land from what has been done in production. And that gives us total confidence that our whole pipeline is working as expected, right? From the very beginning to the very end. And that's it. We've made a really powerful tool on which we can iterate quickly with the confidence. Ah, oh, and the we are getting better with each iteration. And with the vision of our product manager, Ralph, and our leader, uh, director, Salmas, we are going to push this product one step further uh, and really bring the peace of mind to our merchants. But this is the beginning. <laughs> Remember I told you about a vast data that's available for us. It's there. It's ours. And this is just one application of what we can do to automatize processes for our merchants. The other applications are limitless, right? We can do logistics. We can do uh, fulfillments. We can do marketing. We can do financing. But to actually do so, we need people. So if you're interested, please come talk to me. I'll stick around. Thank you very much for your attention.